Okay, hi everyone. It is 102. I'm going to get started just so we can be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I think I had mentioned in our last meeting that I think if we um, make these meetings go about an hour, I think the rest of the time we can cover a lot of what we have on our agenda. Um, but if there's any requests for anything you want to cover today that wasn't on the agenda, just let me know. Um, all right, this meeting is being recorded and um, we will be posting all the recordings on our website and then on YouTube, just so that you know, uh, which will be hopefully a good resource for people. They can check back in if they ever have to miss our meetings. Um, and thanks to, I think Peter is gonna be helping us get our website updated. So that will be great. Okay, so for today, my um, main things that I was thinking we can touch base on, um, as I had mentioned briefly in our last meeting, uh, we recently participated in a DNA extraction kit ring test that was presented at DNA Aquanet meeting. That was two weeks ago now, I think. And um, that was presented by Valentin Vesselon. He did an awesome job and I will be uh, like recapping his presentation today. And we can just kind of go over the results. And I'm hoping that it will help inspire us thinking about what sort of ring tests or intercalibration exercises we might want to do in California. Um, to help us kind of move the ball further down the field in terms of uh, standardizing some of these methods. So that was my main goal for today. Um, then also, if we have time at the end, um, we have an algae DNA sampling SOP that we've been using for our statewide stream algae. And we've been using it now for a couple of years. And I realized like I've never floated it to anyone um, outside of kind of our group that's been using it. So if we have time at the end of today, I would uh, maybe post it to you guys and you can tell me if there are any tweaks that you would suggest um, to that protocol. So is there anything else that anybody wants to put on the agenda for today? Otherwise, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I see I was just bugging um, Zacchaeus about DNA Aquanet. And so I see Holly that you're on the line you, did you attend um, most of DNA Aquanet or were you just there like the one day that you presented? I was there literally from my talk and yes. the, the timing was so terrible for the East of Coast course, and I wasn't totally. at 3 a.m. So, yeah. I mean, of course for you, you but um, I was actually just going to say they've just sent out an email saying the talks are now posted on YouTube. Yeah. So um, I'm going to find the link and post it in the chat, but okay. I'm presuming most of the presentations are available for, for public viewing now. Yes. Yeah. It looks like they posted like almost everything on YouTube, which is awesome. And because um, there were some that even if I caught, like I wanted to go back and catch key details of. And um, but yeah, like some of them were three in the morning, so it was impossible to catch them <laughs> live. <laughs> um, cool. All righty. And I think that's it. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead then and jump in and just kind of go over the ring test results, which I thought were pretty interesting. Um, and like I said, I'm hoping that this will just kind of get us thinking about what are some ring type ring test type things we want to do here or into calibration exercises that we think would be useful for uh, California. All right. So, um, okay, so like I said, this talk was given by Valentin. So he put together, he did the data analyses. He like uh, commanded this whole ship and getting all the samples out to everyone to do the um, actual ring test itself. So he really did such an amazing job um, and presented on this like two weeks ago. In total, there were about 17 participating labs in the ring test. Um, and the big questions that the ring test was looking to answer were um, what is the impact of DNA extraction kit and uh, PCR polymerases on the resulting community composition from diatom samples. So they focus specifically on diatom samples because that's what they've been working on um, for their bioassessment program. So that's what the focus of uh, focus was for this ring test. Um, all right, so. The ring test as it stands today had four key questions that it was targeting, um, Q, one, two, three, and four. And so I've tried to illustrate them here. So for questions one and two, they were interested in seeing how different labs using the same DNA extraction kit, um, what their results looked like 
if all labs were using the same DNA extraction kit, that was question one. And then question two was what do results look like if all DNA or if all labs use their preferred DNA extraction kit? So a lot more variability in the actual DNA extraction kit and how does that impact the resulting communities from these diatom samples? So the samples that were sent to everybody were the same. Um, one of them was a diatom mock community sample that the lab had put together. Uh, one of them was an actual river sample and one of them was a lake sample. So they were all samples that were like homogenized and standardized back in the lab and then they were sent out to all the participating labs. Um, for questions three and four, it was similar um, where once again, question three, all labs were asked to use the same PCR polymerase for doing an amplification step on uh, DNA extract that had been sent to them. And then in question four, all labs were asked to use their preferred PCR polymerase. So they were looking at the variability that's introduced by different PCR polymerases. So again, for those two questions, um, the reference lab, they call it, or like the original lab that was putting together this experiment had DNA extracts that they homogenized, standardized, and then sent out to all of the participating labs to do the amplifications as well. Um, so that's kind of the setup of the experiment. So I will walk you through some of the findings so far. So, um, all right, so in question one, as I said, we have those three standard samples that got sent out to all the participating labs and they were all asked to use the same DNA extraction kit, which in this case was this nucleus spin soil kit. Um, as you can see, um, these bar plots here, we have the first one is all that like mock community sample. The second one was a river sample. And then the third one is this lake sample. On the x-axis, you have all the different participating labs. And this RL1, 2, and 3, those are that's the reference lab. And they did three replicates for all of their samples. You can see um, just hopefully visually looking across all of these samples that when all labs were asked to use the same DNA extraction kit, you see really nice consistent results in the diatom community composition among all the different sample types in all the different participating labs. So the take home message really from this one, all labs perform DNA extractions on the same three samples and the results are really similar. Um, one of the main things that the ring test was interested in querying um, was what sort of differences do we see um, in terms of the biological index scores that end up getting calculated from that community composition data. So even though there's like really good consistency in all of the community composition data across all the participating labs with all those different methods, there's like little bits of variability. How much does that impact your resulting scores? And what they were seeing was that there are um, there's some variability in the resulting score. So in these graphs, again, on the x-axis, you have your participating labs. On your y-axis, you have your diatom index score that they were calculating here. It's called the IPS, the index of pollution sensitivity. Um, and so they calculated those scores. So there is some variability, but it is small. Um, and the maximum amount of variability between samples was 0 0.8. Um, which I have now learned is like very small for this French diatom index. And it's actually a smaller variability than you tend to see when it's multiple taxonomists generating the data with microscopy. So it's below that level of variability. So it's considered like a passing score um, because there's such small amount of variability. Um, so that's a good finding. So from their perspective, they said, you know, this ring test was successful. We saw that even when different labs are using um, the same DNA extraction kit and there's minor amounts of variability, index scores remain uh, consistent, so that's good. Okay, so then moving on into the second part of that question where um, again, using those same environmental samples, the labs were asked to do their DNA extractions, but with their preferred DNA extraction kits. So you can see in this table on the left-hand side, these are all the different kits that the different labs used. Um, this time about nine labs were participating. Of course, this was all happening during COVID, so there were certain labs that had to drop out at different points along the way. Um, and so if we do a quick look at the resulting diatom community composition from these samples, we're seeing a lot more variability in the participating lab results. And um, overall, all the labs detected the same species, but they were had different relative abundances of those species within the sample. So we're seeing a lot more variability among the labs uh, depending on the different DNA extraction kits that they were using. 
So one of the questions was what exactly, um, oh, okay, so how much, uh, just looking at this kind of a different way, what sort of variability were we seeing? There's enough variability that you can discriminate those different participating labs and their DNA extraction kits. Um, so this is just another way of visualizing that data through some ordinations where again, all of these um, labs are clustered according to the different DNA extraction kit that they were using. Um, and so that we are seeing some like distinct clustering based on which of these DNA extraction kits they were using. So the follow-up question was like, what exactly is it about these DNA extraction kits that introduces any amount of like bias or variability in the resulting community composition? And one, um, I guess, hypothesis is that it is uh, the result of the different enzymes that are used in those DNA extraction kits. So in this plot, it's the same data, it's the same samples clustered by, or you know, uh, the ordinations performed on the community composition in all those different samples and then they're visualizing it here pulling out which of the samples either like use proteinase k or not or which rnases are used in the dna extraction kit and we can see that there is some clustering or similarity um, based on the enzymes that's actually used in the extraction kit so this is something that they want to follow up on and see what other components of the dna extraction kit could actually be introducing some of that variability um, but it is just interesting to try and think about what exactly is it uh, causing that result in the community composition among those different samples. Um, okay, so then again, um, with the second question where each lab was using their own DNA extraction kits. So now we're seeing there's much more variability that's introduced into the uh, resulting community composition. And so then how does that translate into diatom index scores? And what sort of variability are you seeing in your diatom index scores? Um, so in contrast to that, like question one, when there was like, really tiny variability in the index scores. There's definitely more variability in the index scores after all these different labs using different DNA extraction kits, but the variability is still considered within the range of acceptability. So it's still less than they tend to see um, when different taxonomists are performing the taxonomic analyses on the diatom samples. So it's still considered acceptable. So in this case, the max variability that they saw between labs was about 1.3 points um, in the index score so it's still pretty little so that i would say is like a pretty optimistic finding that even if we're seeing uh fairly big variability or what is big but so some variation in the diatom community composition that the index stores are still pretty consistent um so that there's like potentially some room for that sort of variability um Okay, I can pause there if there were any questions that I may be able to answer, or I can just go on to questions three and four. Okay, okay cool. Um, Susie, right. sorry, there's, there's, oh, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. there's two questions yeah. in the chat I think you missed. Oh, yes, I'm not looking at that at all. Thank you. Da, da, da. Uh, oh, good question. So the primers that they're using are the, um, I think it's the Vassalon 2017 primers. The forward is like a mix of three primers and then a reverse and they're all diatom specific if that makes sense um why did you choose a nucleus bin kit as a standard DNA extraction method yeah so um holly i don't know the exact answer to that it might be because they were one of the sponsors of the test so there were some commercial lab partners for this experiment um and i think that's why they picked nucleus bin um but i can follow up and ask if it was just potentially the preferred kit for the reference lab who was organizing it i'm not sure um, but we can definitely ask. That's a good question. Uh, okay. So then, all right, our next question, question three. Okay, so uh, similar structure to questions one and two, where uh, with question three now, all the labs were sent uh, DNA extracts. Uh, this time it was four samples. It was a th synthetic community that I think was actually like completely synthesized. So it was like diatom DNA that had been like completely synthesized um, and mixed together. Then there was diatom extract from the mock community, from the river sample and from the lake sample. So that all got shared out to the participating labs and they were asked to do um, an amplification with the uh, standardized DNA polymerase. In this case, they picked the Takara um, TAC polymerase. Um, and similar to what we were seeing in round one, when all labs are asked to use the same exact protocol, the resulting community composition is really, really similar. So really nice, consistent results in terms of community structure 
um, for all these samples across all of the participating labs. Um, you may have spotted one of the labs like had a cross contamination among their samples. So that one was able to be removed for downstream analyses, um, but that's just explains what's happening here with lab I. Um, all right, so relative abundances of diatom species um, was obtained by all participants. So when they did like Z-score calculations, um, everything was really consistent. And again, if we're comparing how the biological index scores um, ended up being calculated for all of these samples, again, really small variation among all the participants. Um, and so really nice consistent diatom index scores across all of the participating labs. Oh, yeah, so what happened in lab I? Yeah. That's what happened. There was some cross contamination. Um, all of the, uh, we didn't find out what lab you were until kind of at the end of the results. I think people could have asked earlier, but we didn't find out. And so everyone wanted to make sure it was I lab I, um, but we weren't. So that was good. Okay. Um, and let's see. So then looking at question four, again, now we're asking all of the labs to use their preferred. Um, polymerase for their amplifications. And again, we're seeing much more variability that's introduced when we have these different labs all using their different polymerases. So there's a table over here on the right hand side of your screen with all the different polymerases that the different labs were using. Um, so we have much more variability introduced. Um, but kind of the take home message again is similar on the lower right hand side of your screen. We see the variability in the index score, and again, it's on the order of, I think it was maybe like one point, it was something like 1.3 again, or 1.5. So really small variability in those diatom index scores, even in spite of um, more variability being introduced in terms of community structure when everyone was using their preferred um, PCR polymerase. So um, the big take home messages from the ring test so far, um, they're seeing really consistent DNA extraction kit and PCR polymerases um, yielded comparable results among all the different participating labs. The variability that was observed between labs using different DNA extraction kits and polymerases was notable, but index scores were still consistent. The plans for future work um, is that they'll focus on identifying what that maximum variability um, might be. So what's our window for how much variability we're willing to tolerate in those diatom index scores um, in order for the scores to be kind of like accepted for um, monitoring in the water framework directive um, application. So that's something that we definitely grapple with here in California too. What sort of variability will you eventually establish for what would be acceptable in terms of index performance? One of the ways that we do it in California is we always compare back to um, the variability that we see in repeat sampling events at a single site. Um, that's one metric that we tend to use. And how do, you, how do you, I guess, calibrate that number for a DNA sequence data? Um, all right, and so then for this project, there are a couple of next steps that they're hoping to do. Um, comparing different high throughput sequencing library prep methods. Um, I don't even know what those would be, but there are options, I guess. And so they're gonna try it for different ones and see how that influences the results. And then, um, and then also potentially, so I think none of this data yet has um, morphological data associated with it. So how different were the index scores? Um, no one has done the like morpho taxonomic analyses yet. So how different are these DNA based index scores to the morphology based index scores? And can you be using those morphology based index scores as a baseline? against which you're comparing your um, DNA based scores. So that is something that is on the horizon for these studies. Um, and that's it. Are there any other questions on this study? I had a question. Yeah. So I don't know anything about diatoms. How, yeah. how diverse is that sample expected to actually be? Like, are the, are the unique genotypes of these species mm -hmm. like incredibly different or is it like a single nucleotide in the whole marker makes mm -hmm. like different species yeah it's like how many different species actually are being detected there right yeah that is a good question so i don't know off the top of my head for these samples i mean what the richness actually is or was i'm trying to think if i actually even have the um like for example this one 
So what are we looking at? That's like 40, no, less than that. That's like 30 or so genera or species that they're telling us from each of these different samples. Um, and I would say that's probably comparable to what we detect in some of our stream samples that we've been looking at in California. Um, but that's a good question. And hopefully maybe the morphology results will be giving us some nice insight into if we're picking up more, uh, greater richness with the DNA-based methods, which we could expect um, compared to the microscopy results. Um, these samples were analyzed doing like DADA2 in the ASB mm -hmm. clustering. So um, it would have been detecting in theory, you know, as much richness as possible with the exclusion of sequencing error. Um, and so, or yeah, but I would like to see how- that was my it, question, yeah. I was gonna circle back like, is the polymerase that you chose a high fidelity polymerase or not? Mm -hmm. And it's enough variation in this to really matter or not? Yeah. Um, I guess from my perspective, it's yeah. if there's only 40 taxa that are being pulled out for this group in this mm -hmm. market, that's like not comparable to something like CO1 where you're going to mm -hmm. be retrieving 1,500 taxa. Yeah. It might not, the difference in the extraction might make a bigger difference when there's mm -hmm. actually rare things. Can you talk more about the high fidelity polymerase and what that, what the impact of that would be using one or not? So if if there if you have taxa where um, it's a pretty conserved marker, so mm -hmm. a single um, nucleotide actually is the difference between species within yeah. the same genus. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a low fidelity polymerase, you can get yeah. a you can get an error that actually puts in a f incorrect erroneous base, and you can artificially inflate diversity that way. Okay. Um, Especially if you're doing something like out of two for ASV and it's not linking back to a taxonomy, if you're just doing yeah. like similarity matching and differences, yeah. then you're mm -hmm. inflating that. Got Does it. that make sense? Yeah. So in using a mock community, would you be able to see like how often that happened then? You know, if we have this like mixed mock community that was whatever it was, you know, 20 species that they mixed together. Can we be looking yes. for that signal and then say whether or not it looks yes. like, yeah. So 200%. Yeah. So that's why I was asking like how yeah. diverse these things are and how much variability there is. So yeah. Rachel Myers is actually, I think, definitely done this and she's based off of which markers they're mm -hmm. using. It's either a problem or not. Okay. And the problem is just like how much of a problem. Yeah. And she actually has landed on a better, more consistent, high fidelity. Okay. Okay. I'd be curious to see which one that was. So that's what they're using for the Cal eDNA work. Is that? Okay. Yes. Cool. Well, okay. So interestingly, not for the early stuff, but for later stuff, yes, okay. it's better. Cool. Nice. Cool. Um, I missed it. Did we mention what that polymerase is or did you know specifically? Um, is that a question for Adam? Yeah, sorry, oh, yeah. Adam. I, yeah. Um, yeah. Is, do you have a like kit recommendation for the like the best high fidelity polymer polymerase at this point? Uh, I do. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, here, I'm good. I'll make a note that we'll follow up. <laughs> we can follow up with Rachel and figure out what um, that one is. But this is not targeted at things that Holly necessarily likes. Mm -hmm. so this okay. is like for CO one and plant stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just ask because we, we've gone back and forth about the high fidelity polymerase. I mean, I use that um, during my PhD, and, but then mm -hmm. the Earth Microbiome Project was not really recommending the high fidelity for a mm. while. Um, so I don't know. It, I made an argument on both sides, but I am still kind of interested in this topic. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, let's like put a pin in that and think about it for future thoughts around what the programs here might be interested in using. Hmm. Okay. Um, Holly, so what yeah, were some of the, question. oh yeah, sorry. Oh yeah. So I was just curious, uh, Holly, you mentioned that the earth microbiome sort of recommended against the high fidelity. Could you elaborate? What was the rationale? 
Kira. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So um, so right now, I think Earth Microbiome, they're recommending like a hot start Kappa kit, which I believe when we looked into it, I don't think it is a proofreading enzyme. Um, but the, the hot start sort of has similar function in theory, right? Because it, it prevents non-specific amplification when you're setting up your PCR reaction. Um, the other thing is that we had issues. So we tried out the Q5 polymerase. Um, I can't remember what manufacturer it was. And we were just having like massive issues. I don't know if it was reagent contamination, but basically nothing was working. So <laughs> there were there were a bunch of things that we tried in the lab. Um, and we were we were having issues with some of the uh, the proofreading polymerases and then we sort of just fell back on what the earth microbiome project was recommending so this like hot start but possibly non-proofreading polymerase um and that that's just where things stood but it was always in our minds that we should be using a proofreading polymerase we just couldn't really get it to work the way that we wanted to it was causing more problems for us great thank you Got it. Okay, cool. Do you know, this is honestly something I haven't um, thought too much about, but it's uh, definitely worth thinking about now going forward. Um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good thing to think about in terms of consistency. Uh, all right. Any other questions on the ring test? Zach was brave enough to ask who lab I is. Okay. But, oh, um, I, know. <laughs> that. I know. So it was actually it was agreed among participants that it would be um, everything would be anonymous. So we could find out who we were, but we didn't find out who anybody else was. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, which seems fair. Uh, it was a, it was a pandemic. Stuff happens. Um, OK, so cool. So I think, you know, that brings us to uh, what I kind of wanted to talk about today was in our dream world, um, or if you're thinking about your own research program, so what are some of the areas in some of your pipelines of either collecting or preserving or extracting or analyzing your sample? What are some places where you feel like you have room for improvement or you've been wanting to optimize or you would benefit from participating uh, in a ring test or getting the results of a ring test to help you optimize your protocols. Um, if you have participated in a ring test before or one of these like intercalibration type of exercises, I'd love to hear about that. Or if you are planning on in the near future, I think we have at least one that's on our docket coming up. Um, but I'd love to hear from folks if this is something that is like on your radar or you'd like to see happen and for what step in your protocol. So the floor is open. Hmm. Does anyone have one planned? No. Mm -hmm. no I don't know my own talk at DNA Aquanet, but we have been doing some of the bioinformatics tests. Mm -hmm. um, so I, if, if people watch my talk, which you don't have to, but we I have did. been assessing <laughs> the bioinformatics pipelines side of things. So just trying to test um, the shift from OTUs to ASBs has been really yeah. stressing us out. And we were sort of worried about how it was going to impact our biological conclusions. So yeah. what we recently did is we used... Um, we just used some data sets that we had in-house to, to look at four different pipelines, so two OTU pipelines, um, CHIME 1, UCLUS, CHIME 2, VSEARCH, and then two ASB pipelines, which were DADA 2 and Deblur. Mm. And we were looking at 18S, you know, 18S data. So we had a complex community that was marine sediments, and then we had a um, kind of a low complexity community, mm. which is where we picked out the individual nematodes, and we knew what went into the tube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's we have a paper that's just going to be submitted hopefully next week on everything I talked about. But one of the questions that came up in in the um, in the DNA Aquanet kind of discussion was that it would be really great if we could do this for other loci, mm. specifically CO1 or even just like different 18S primers in different like di in diatoms or or another primer mm -hmm. set. 
Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was it, data set complexity really plays a big role. So it seems like yeah. the lower complexity data sets you have, you just have more stochasticity and kind of randomness yeah. in how um, things get clustered. Okay. But a lot of problems tend to go away when you use ASVs. Um, yeah. But I would say the blur as a pipeline is not functioning very well okay. in, in general. So I would like strongly, strongly recommend Data2 for, for people okay. right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the blur is just really, it, it cuts out a lot of the rare taxa, which was kind of surprising for us. Got it. Um, is it but, built for speed? Was that one of the things about the blur? Yeah, yeah, so the blur, yes, the blur is parallelizable. So it's it's specifically meant to work per sample. Yeah. And it's meant to be able to parallelize that across, you know, all the samples that you have, whereas Data2, Data2 basically works in, um, as an Illumina run. So it's kind mm -hmm. of modeling the errors based on the specific properties of your Illumina run. Yeah. So you have to put everything into memory at once. Um, but okay. that seems to be biologically better than the Deblur approach. Okay. okay. Have people tried this? That just makes me think of. So let's say I have two Illumina runs that I want to be comparing. This is something that is happening in my soon. Um, and normally I'm just running data two on a single plate at a time, like so one one run at a time. Does it make sense to run? Do I pool my uh, fast queues and then run data two, or do I run data two on my two different plates and then try and line up my ASVs afterwards? Why have I not thought about this before? Yeah, did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been meaning to ask this exact question to yeah. to Ben. Callahan, because yeah, I, yeah. I need to know the two, but I, I okay. actually suspect it's, it's run specific. I think okay. my, my, my gut feeling is that you have to do data two on individual Illumina runs because the right. error profiles are going to be different. Right. And then you, because ASVs are in theory, not it, they're, they're static, right? They're, right. they're specific sequences. Yeah. I think yeah. you just merge the ASV tables and after you're matching you after. Run. Okay. Well, where's my R package for that? <laughs> I mean, um, or maybe there is a time to command that I just haven't used yet. Okay, cool. Holly, we did. So we have a study that one day will be submitted soon um, where we had done 18S. What did we use? Um, we used 18S V9 and 18S V4. Um, what did you use for your um, nematode samples? So Which we're all... We're always working in V1, V2. V1, V2. Okay. Yeah. So we had done algae biofilm samples, 18S V4 and 18S V9, and we ran them through um, Mother and Chime 1 and eventually Chime 2. And then we calculated index scores and um, like the diatom biological index scores. And so far... Um, a very similar conclusion where we saw a lot of variability depending on bioinformatic pipeline. Um, if we were doing like ODU clustering at 95 or 97% similarity, but then when we did ASVs, there was like much more consistency in the biological index scores um, when we clustered using A's or when we did ASVs instead of OTUs. Um, that one will be submitted at some point sometime soon. Where are you guys going to submit? I think we were thinking to do meta, what is it? MGMG, -M -G, something like that. Um, yeah, that, that new journal. We're going for methods in ecology and evolution, the BES okay. journal. Well, cool. I'll be on the lookout. That'll be great. The other, thing, the other thing is it seems like um, doing some bioinformatic comparisons on, because it seems like the abundant tax are always going to be resilient to any, yeah. of, any, any changes in the yeah. parameters, like yeah. your abundant tax that stick out. But like if you're looking at rare biosphere taxa, which is important, especially if you're looking at like host associated microbiome taxa or like gut yeah. content, yeah, that's what gets really impacted by the bioinformatics mm -hmm. pipeline, which is, you know, not great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like, because like Bray Curtis, even even the PCOAs, even like across OTUs, like when you had 60,000 OTUs versus like only a thousand dot dot two. Yeah. ASVs, like your Bray Curtis was not even very different. Yeah. Got it. Got it. That's important to keep in mind. Yeah, that's something else that we are thinking about too for when the application is like calculating biological index score. What is our threshold for like rare taxa? And are we including sequences that we, you know, 
have three of, or, you know, are we including species that we only have like three sequences for, or should it be 10 sequences in a sample? And how does that impact your index score? Um, Cause it does, especially for like our algal index in California, which is based on presence absence. So if something is really low abundance, but you count it, that could like really impact your score. So where are we drawing that line um, for inclusion based on sequence data? Have you discussed anything as well, like minimum sequencing effort? Because I mean, I, I can totally see the value of that kind of cutoff you're talking yeah. about, but you yeah. have to implement like, you'd have to have minimum 100,000 sequences per sample totally. to assume that the sequencing effort was, yeah. was high enough to be able to use that cutoff. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a consideration, um, but we have not had any like thoughts towards what the recommendation should be eventually. Um, but that's such a good point. Uh, okay, so cool. So I love hearing about some of the other bioinformatic comparisons that folks are doing. Um, I was recently, I don't know if anyone else participates in the GEDWEG working group, the like government environmental DNA working group that I that is run by some USGS folks. They meet, I think the first Wednesday of every month, they have like a Zoom meeting. Um, I know it's like Jason Ferrante and maybe Richard Mitchell, is that right? Um, participated in it. I've only joined like a couple of times, but something just came across their listserv, which was if anyone um, uses the Zymo preservation solution, um, which I think I can't remember actually, Josh, um, I think you're on the line. Um, I think that Josh at Scorp has been using Zymo preservation buffer for some of their samples. Um, we have routinely been using like the Kyogen lysis buffer as our preservation solution for our algae samples, but um, I am like not wedded to it necessarily. And especially this past year, we ran into this issue where the Kyogen, what was it, the power soil kit was suddenly uh, being retired and that was what was compatible with our preservation solution. And we had like a couple hundred samples that were still stored in this like old preservation solution that was in theory not gonna be compatible with the new kit. And we had like momentary scrambling. scrambling. Um, what's that? Oh no. Was that you, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, we have we have been using the DNA RNA shield from Zymo okay. um, to preserve to preserve samples and it works reasonably well. It's not um, you you are more locked into the Zymo kits if you right. use it. There is there. It's not terribly compatible with all the other kits, so you'd have yeah. to test it with yours. But we found yeah. Kyogen doesn't play very well with it. OK, um, but okay. it but it does a good job of preserving okay. um, RNA and DNA. Uh, yeah, it's, okay. it's worked really well. Cool. All right. And um, and so the thing that it was making me think about was I think there was a paper recently where someone was looking at silica beads, which obviously folks have been using for years and years, but I was always seeing them in studies where people were taking like water eDNA samples, like for fish monitoring and then preserving in silica beads and then doing an extraction. And I was never optimistic that it would work for stuff like our algae biofilm samples that I just felt like were so like gunky and waterlogged. I was just, um, I don't know, just pessimistic about the thought of the silica beads being able to adequately remove the moisture from them. But I'm not sure if that's true or are silica beads the way that we could go. And then we wouldn't have to worry about these incompatibility issues um, for extraction kits and that sort of thing. So. That was somewhere that I was like, if I had a dream pot of money and uh, unlimited time right now, I would love to do just a comparison of sample preservation kit using either like the Zymo kit, maybe this like ki a Kyogen preservation solution of some variety, silica bead, and then like nothing. That would be maybe my dream extraction or um, preservation comparison study. Um, because if we could move to something like silica beads for our algae DNA samples, it would make our lives a lot easier um, because our field crews wouldn't have to be packing out, you know, tubes of preservation solution. We wouldn't have to worry about volume issues when we're doing our extractions. We wouldn't have to worry about kit compatibility. It would definitely make our lives easier. Um, but I really don't know if I trust the silica beads. So does anyone here have experience with silica beads? I don't know. Adam, you probably use are using exclusively ethanol for your stuff or um we're we pretty much extract from the field is 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Or directory to the lab uh, is our tact because because we're neurotic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Zach, what about you? What do you end up using? Yeah. Are you talking about me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So usually just ethanol. Um, but um, sorry, I didn't know if you meant Zach Gold. I don't yep, sorry. I don't see him. I don't see him today. Sorry, Zach. Yep. But um, I will say um, right when I was leaving SIGA, they were working on a bunch of Actually, one of those papers may have recently come out, but oh, the antifreeze or yeah, the yeah, antifreeze yeah, yeah. one came out, and then they have some other, some others as well that they were looking at. Um, I'll have to follow up, but um, you know, it's it's um, you know, it's promising to see to mm -hmm. see like antifreeze or yeah, uh, I think uh, there was somebody working on formaldehyde. Mm. Um, <laughs> which has a lot of other problems but um but yeah i mean i at this point I, i'm just pretty standard trying to yeah. get it to work in my own lab and yeah and i've started just using ethanol so cool cool sounds good um yeah the antifreeze one was interesting because one of the selling points was that you could use it um in places where like dry campuses or um, like a lot of, I guess, reservations maybe have alcohol policies that meant that you couldn't bring alcohol or yeah, ethanol on site. But so the yeah. antifreeze you could bring and use for your preservation and they were seeing like comparable preservation and stuff. So um, that the, was other, really the other big advantage of the um, of the antifreeze is that if you are trying to do morphological sampling or if you're going to do morphology and then extract you, your um, antifreeze will basically preserve the structures, at least from what I've found, better. Yeah. It's cool. it, um, things don't get as brittle, I guess. Cool. Okay. So. Nice. Cool. So, uh, yeah. um, preservative that we use in the nematode world that solves this problem too is called DETS. It's a DMSO EDTA solution saturated with salt. Um, mm -hmm. So basically. This is our replacement for formalin because it preserves DNA as well as morphology. And the morphology is basically, it's, it's just as good as formalin, even cool. though some taxonomists will disagree, but it, it is. Yeah. Um, you can even use SEM on the desk preserve oh samples. My gosh. Yeah. Oh. I can, so we have protocols on my website I can send. Oh, cool. um, it's kind of expensive to make up, but it would be totally kit agnostic. The only thing you'd probably have to consider is because it's a salt solution, it might mess with some spin columns. So you might have to do like a pre-wash wash that step. Yeah. yeah. So we, we usually wash it off on a 45 micron sieve, okay. but in the field, it's super easy because we just take Nalgene bottles. Um, so it's usually one-to-one des -one and yeah. sediment. And so you just pre-fill the Nalgene bottles and then yeah. just pop Dump in the it. sediment until you reach the line and then you shake yeah. it and then room yeah. tape room temperature stable and also it's not hazardous so you can ship it like very easily <laughs> and so good. Uh, yeah that's it's so great. cool have you done have you extracted like microbial dna also we have not okay. yeah that's so that's that's the big question is whether you can do microbial dna yeah um definitely for like the larger myofauna and macrofauna it's great yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd have to do some tests about yeah. whether it's microbial. So we usually we'll, we'll still take, we'll still take parallel samples for microbial mm -hmm. extraction in like freezer bags. Yeah. Or yeah, the lysis buffer. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's so good. Uh, we're hitting this thing. I can't remember if I bugged you about that. Um, previously, but we have for some of our like DNA library gap filling that we're trying to do for some of the marine benthic macroinvertebrate taxa if we knew that we could get dna out of the um, formalin preserved samples then we would be able to fill lots of gaps in our dna reference library like very quickly um but i don't know that we are optimistic that we'd be able to do that but if only they had been preserved in something that was uh like way more compatible that would be so nice. But I had been like nosing around and because I think there is a Kyogen extraction kit that says it's for formalin preserved samples. I feel like it's like the formalin and like, what is it, gel kind of like tissue samples or something. It's an extraction kit for like that kind of work. 
And I was like, oh, this work on some of our like museum specimens and we could actually do some DNA library filling, but I don't know that anyone has had success doing that. I'm not sure. Uh, what's that? Histology slide preps and stuff like that. Say that again, Adam, sorry. I said there is an abstraction kit for that, but I think it really only works well for like human DNA type human stuff. Like, okay. very, like they found something that works and when you know the organism that works type of thing. Okay. But I would also point people at the Academy of Science report from like eight years ago, uh -huh. a 200 page report about exactly all the stupid chemistry that happens to DNA when it's supposed to formalin. Got it. And the reasons it's locked forever, locked away forever. No, no, that's not the scary part. The scary part is uh, it cuts it into small fragments. Fine. I'm okay with that. On a stochastic, completely unpredictable way, it changes base pairs. Oh, geez. Oh, well, great. <laughs> how it will happen. So. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Can you eventually, can you do, like when you used to do like error correcting for pack bio, can you just sequence it like a whole bunch and then line up and then kind of remove those errors or? Maybe. Yeah. It, okay. uh, the main thing is, is it's a complication. It's a nightmare. It sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Well, I am, now that I have this idea of like testing out the silica beads, I like really kind of want to do it. Um, but if there are other types of ring tests that people think they could benefit from, I would love to hear from folks along the way. So if something occurs to you, shoot me an email. Um, if you sound like, you, or if you think you want to participate in a ring test, regardless of what it is, um, let me know. And this would be a great opportunity for a grad student, maybe even if someone has a grad student that they need to um, keep out of trouble. And, um, but otherwise I might think a little bit more about the idea of doing like a algae benthic sample um, preservation test and um, that might be happening this summer and if I can think about how we could fund it then um, anybody that wants to be involved I would welcome you to join it'd be cool um, okay anything else otherwise with our last like 11 minutes, um, I might just pull up my algae DNA SOP and see if folks want to give me their thumbs up, thumbs down on it. Um, unless there was anything else. Is there anything else from the group that we want to talk about today? Oh, did I miss anything in the chat? Uh, cool. Great. Thanks, Holly. And feel free to, if you want to email those around, feel free. <laughs> cool. Okay, perfect. So let me see. I'm just going to pull up my SOP. Here we are. Ta -da. All right. Can people see this? I can like make it bigger. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So for our algae DNA samples, um, with the stream samples, basically you have your stream transect that's like 150 meters and you're collecting at 11 points along your transect um, and then compositing that biofilm gunky perfite sample and so you've been you have a bucket basically of algae goo at the end and that gets like homogenized and the sample gets taken out for like diatom microscopy and then soft bite algae microscopy um, and now we ask them to also take you know, like 50 mils or so and set it aside for DNA. And so we've been asking them to filter it. Um, and the crews have two options. They can be using either the Swinex apparatus, which you see here, um, which they can just use with like a syringe filter, or some of the crews go back to the lab same day to filter like their chlorophyll A sample and their ash free dry mat sample. And so we say you can also use like a column filter um, and just do it that way. Um, or the filter funnel rather. Um, so that's why we have settled on like a 45 millimeter um, cellulose, cellulose nitrate filter. That's what they've been using the past couple of years. Um, and so they have those two options. You can either do the Swinex or you can do the filter funnel. Um, we ask you to use the cellulose nitrate filter. We send them like a two mil 
tube that has the lysis buffer already loaded in it. Um, and so we essentially ask them to like, you know, do their filtration, record how much they can get on the filter because it can vary like so widely because the biomass is like our, you know, highly variable depending on the different streams. Um, and so then they just tell us like how much they filtered and then we ask them to like ball it up and shove it into the tube. Um, that's what it is so far. Um, but right now, you know, this is all we've had included for how they should be sterilizing or prepping their sample. Um, not all labs, you know, they definitely don't have access to an autoclave or anything like that. Um, minimal options, like they wouldn't necessarily all have an acid bath, although I think that's easier for them to put together. Um, bleach, in contrast, they would all have access to. Um, they don't all have access to like milliq water. Um, so that would be harder to come by too. Um, and, and then I can scroll down. I can also just, I can send you guys the link to this. Um, but if you had a chance, like, does this look readable? Does it look like we're including everything we need to? Would you make any recommendations on how else we should be asking them to, you know, sterilize their equipment or not? Um, this year I will actually, I'll be sending everybody the best practices, like field sampling guidelines that we all put together as part of this group. I'll just start like stapling that to the front of this so that people have like a little bit more of a like holistic recommendations on how to minimize field contamination. Um, but does that, does this look like something your crews are using or you guys are using with your labs out in the field? Is there room for improvement here? What can we be adding to make this more clear or anything like that? Any feedback, welcome. You guys are reading so diligently. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Susie, with these protocols, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. Are you um, are you having them kind of be tested in the field? Like, I don't, I don't know if this is even feasible, but I always mm -hmm. find like I make these protocols and then I give them to someone and then they come back and they get the samples, but then they're yeah. like, I totally didn't understand this part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Almost like so, having like a buddy in the field to go through the protocol and kind of make notes to improve it. Um, yeah. Just with with points that are kind of muddy and, and don't make sense. Yeah, that's a great um, question. Uh, I think hopefully when this protocol gets like formally adopted into our statewide program, um, like statewide protocols, that hopefully there will be, uh, it'll be included in like our intercalibration events. And we can begin to do a little bit more of that sort of like troubleshooting. We did the first like two years that we had sent this out was when we did a lot of like on the fly troubleshooting. So we had actually like sent out filters that were clogging a lot faster. And then we got a lot of feedback from groups that like this is overflowing or I can't get this one to work. And so we kind of refined the protocol those first two years. Um, and settled on this filter, which has been like a lot more agreeable. Um, at one point too, we were getting feedback that like folks couldn't get the filter in like the little two mil tube. And so for one year we shifted to like a larger volume tube. Um, but then that made like a lot of headaches for the extraction process like downstream because we were having to double or triple the number of extractions that we were doing per sample. Um, anyway, so it has had some like refinement in hearing from these crews that have been adopting it. Um, and my hope is that then once it gets officially like adopted into the statewide SOPs, that it becomes like part of this intercalibration event where then we can see how everyone's doing it by hand and, um, and we can like do any sort of course correction that needs to happen then. Um, yeah, but that, that would be great. Okay. That's, that's, that's actually reassuring that you've had yeah. so much 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, so the Moore Foundation now is really pushing yeah. protocol.io. Oh, okay, yeah. Like uh -huh. Central repository where people should yeah. be doing stuff. And so for our Moore Foundation grant, we're actually required oh, to put cool. our protocol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice because you have, um, first of all, you can like execute it. Like yeah. um, you can click like the start button and it has check boxes. So oh, you that's can clever. Use it in the field if you have a yeah. smartphone. But the yeah. second thing is it gets a DOI assigned to it. So if yeah. anyone wants to like cite this, you can, yeah. you can pull statistics or you can at least have something deposited that's kind of yeah. like, this is a static document. It will not change. It has a yeah. CFI. Um, it'd be really nice to have like protocols like this visible if, you know, like if my lab ever wanted to do algae yeah. or someone else wants to do nematodes, yeah. we're trying to put our stuff up in there. Holly, that is such a great idea. Yeah, I've been talking about protocols.o a ton with this like ocean best practices group and, um, and we should totally put this on there. So I think that's a great idea. We'll do that. And I think yeah. like, so there's, I don't know how it works. We have like special access because we are, we're grantees, but the protocols that I hope people will help you, but you all, mm -hmm. you can also specify like these collections of protocols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I totally see like, you know, marine monitoring, just like a collection yeah. of protocols, like for all taxa yeah. um, with the, like the central theme being like you're doing this in marine or aquatic systems. Yeah. Cool. No, that's such a good idea. Yeah. We could, I could see us having either like our molecular methods work group little package or even just like a scorp one um but that would be great yeah and and can't you is there's sort of like an option to like fork your protocol or something too right if you were like or maybe just it's a different version number i i'm just getting it confused with git then but um because it would be cool like if someone was doing something similar but then they decided to use like just a slightly different pore size or something and you essentially see like this one is the you know cousin of this protocol and you can kind of do tracking of the origin of protocol that way um, that's I think it has like Git like yeah. features like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It's it's like a yeah, it's a mixture between a lab notebook and GitHub. It seems like, but yeah. it's much more user friendly than GitHub. Yeah, I love that idea. We should totally do that. Also, because otherwise, I've just been like sending this out all the time, um, and it would be so much easier if I could be sending people to the online online place. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, well, I'll post this to the group, and if anybody wants to marinate over it at some point later you can just let me know if there's anything that you would recommend changing i kind of feel inclined to like i don't know refresh the wording um just to make it even more user friendly and like i said include that bit of best practices for no uh contamination in the field that sort of thing and any other recommendations feel free to let me know um our field season will probably start within the next couple of weeks so um it'll be great to have this out to everybody but otherwise thanks for the conversation you guys today and this was fun i like talking about the ring test um and like i said if there are any thoughts on potential ring test or intercalibration exercises you want to be participating in um even if you were like i don't know that i have funding or time but i really want this question answered like let me know and we'll find a way to make it happen and um now that i'm thinking about this preservation question for our algae samples i like kind of want to do it so uh, I might be tagging you all about that later. So anyways, it's good to see everyone and to hear about everybody's stuff. And um, that's it next month. Um, we don't necessarily have anything. We have a tent or potential tentative talk from um, Colin Classic on some of his eDNA work, if I can um, get him scheduled. Otherwise, shoot me an email if you have someone you'd like to hear from or you'd like to volunteer um, for giving one of our little like your methods work group talks, but otherwise, thanks everyone. It was great to see you. So we'll catch up next time. Bye.